Goldman Sachs has just released a damning report on where they believe the S&P 500 is moving to next. But with the 47th record high in the books, should we really be concerned as traders and investors right now? Well, one thing's for sure, somebody's moving flows into alternative assets. And if you've been watching the channel for a while now, you'd know that we've been loving gold and silver. What a Friday it was. With Bitcoin potentially about to break out this week, the S&P 500 in the possibility of a lost decade coming, and of course, opportunities everywhere, let's get into our special weekend report where we're covering stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. Join us, guys. This will be one you don't want to miss. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the special weekend edition of The Daily Show. My name's Tom, and in today's video, there is a lot to discuss because the opportunities out there right now are abundant, and of course, we love that on this channel. Let's get started, though, with Goldman Sachs' latest report, and that is showing that they believe over the next 10 years, the market could be heading for a lost decade. Now, you may have heard this before, but don't click off because, of course, lost decades are a very important concept of investing and trading theory. And we saw this discussion point come up in 2021. Now, if you remember, in 2022, we actually saw the markets fall off. And this is where we need to discuss the idea of whether this 1930 to 2024 data will hold itself up again during the period of, of course, AI. Now, Goldman Sachs believed that 3% is going to be the annualized return, putting us in one of the worst reporting periods of all time. In fact, the seventh percentile over the next 10 years. Now, has this happened to the US before, you might be asking? Well, funnily enough, it has. And the most notable period recently was, of course, off the tech boom, a market that went into a bubble and then exploded. Now, this led into a lost decade. And of course, that was in terms of valuations. The other notable ones, an inflationary period during the 70s, and of course, out of the Great Depression into a sideways market as the market started to recover. So could we be heading for the same type of thing again as we're in a secular bull market that's been going since 2009 to 2013? Well, the answer is quite simply, yes, we could. And we can see here the worth work by Jeff Winninger. And basically, it shows you that the period of 2009 to 2024 has given us 7.9 times return. Now, this is pretty normal to some of those other periods we discussed. Of course, the most notable great return was the 1978 to 2000 period, but that went into what we call a super bubble. And you can see that by the metrics, especially the gains in the last couple of years. Now, we're not quite heading for that yet, but we are heading for a very similar period to the 1949-1968. And if you've been watching the channel for a while, you would know that this bull market has actually been following the almost same similar path. The previous pullbacks look very similar and the current gains look almost the same. Now, if we do go into a lost decade, it doesn't look very good for us as investors and traders. And more importantly, it's going to be very important for the investors out there. If you're an investor and you want your portfolio to do better over the long term, you may need to be very careful if we do go into what's called a concentrated market. Now, you may notice here that there are several different periods of concentration over time. The hardware bubble of the 1990s was probably the most notable, and you could argue that we're in another hardware bubble right now, driven by semiconductors. Now, I'd like you to pause the video at this point and put a comment down below. Do you think we're in a hardware bubble or a semiconductor bubble in this current market? Just a simple yes or no or your explanation behind it would be interesting. And we will run a few polls on this moving forward because, of course, this will become the discussion. And really, the most important aspect of this is how much of the S&P 500 does the semiconductor market end up taking? Will it be 25%? Will it be 30%? Will it be even higher? The higher it goes, the more chance we actually have of a lost decade. Now, will valuations matter at the moment. Well, as you can see here, valuations haven't mattered when momentum has been strong. And of course, you could argue that we are going in for a very strong momentum right now. And this is why it's very important to kind of keep the FOMO at bay a little bit, but also to be aware of the current momentum in markets and how things could, of course, get worse. Now, why am I saying momentum is strong? We'll have a look here at the S&P 500 net percentage of stocks at 52 week highs. Yes, there are quite a few. And of course, we know that when this happens, look at the year end returns of the next 12 months. 
actually very positive for the bulls. And this is what we've argued for a while. We've seen the Federal Reserve do, of course, a pivot, come in and say they're going to do a rate cut. We'll soon find out who wins the US election, and ultimately both of them are pretty much MMTers. So we will see support, you would think, for the markets. And the data and the stats are really kind of going in with that. The idea that deregulation could be coming to the banks, the idea that it may be easier to do business over the next 12 months has everybody excited. But markets are already starting to pump this in. And of course, with our 47th all-time high in 2024, there is now a 92% chance that we will still have another high for the rest of the year. That's a pretty good stat and you wouldn't usually want to be going against it. Now, whenever we look at things like lost decade discussion, we want to basically ask ourselves the question of, are we there yet? Because remember, lost decades are great to know about, but timing is all important. Well, our good friend Wayne Whaley is back and he's done some cool analysis here with back-to-back double-digit years. So when we see things like this, of course, 2023 and 24 are now going to be double-digit years, will we see 2025 be positive? Well, some interesting stats have come out from Wayne's information and he says that since the 1950s, on average, we have seen positive years but the annual gain has generally only been about 2.9%. Now, that's very far against what you would usually expect. And of course, it's more in line with actually what Goldman Sachs are saying. The more important thing than this, though, would be watch January next year because only seven of the overall 12 periods, so seven, sorry, seven of 12, so of the 19 periods that we had similar stats, only seven were actually up. So it's actually a negative overall correlation there for January, something to keep in mind. So let's go from the lost decade discussion that we'll bring back later on the show to whether we think it is going to see some type of volatility in the market leading into the November election. We know here that uh, Mark Newton believes that there will be some volatility into the market. And we do have some reads telling us that over the next one week to two weeks, we need to be more cautious than normal. And this is because the markets are getting extended from both sentiment percentages and, of course, from every other pretty much RSI, MACD, and indicator in the market. Now, does that mean we want to sell our positions? Well, probably not if you have a longer-term time horizon. Have a look here at S&P 500 operating EPS, which continues to increase. And Charlie Bilio's chart here shows that things are looking pretty good. So it really depends on your time horizon. If you're looking at three months, six months, or 12 months, of course, make sure to subscribe to the channel because we cover that here. But if you're looking at the next couple of weeks, you might want to say, well, let's pump the brakes a little bit, do a bit more day trading, and look for the opportunity to get a buy the dip sometime over this next period. Why could we be saying that though? Well, while everyone's calling buy the dip, what you actually should be doing is looking at other opportunities if you believe the S&P 500 is a little bit too bullish right now and not giving the risk reward. And we've argued now for the last two weeks that we believe that Bitcoin could be one of those opportunities. Take a look here. This is the ADX line coming basically down to five and showing that it is a period of consolidation. Now, whenever we see these periods, we expect large moves. And since we reported on this, of course, Bitcoin has moved up quite a lot. But it's not just this chart, it's flows as well. Combined daily inflows into Bitcoin ETFs has actually just gone up again and is now up there with March. So we are now looking at a significant inflow increase coming through on all of the coins over the last kind of two weeks. And this is a really good sign for everyone that's trying to get on the bull end during October. From the crypto side though, which we'll revisit when we look at the chart soon, let's talk earnings. Because of course, we know that earnings can also lead to further bullish or bearish action in the markets. We've just had the banks kind of kick off and they've done very well. Lending, debt, all of this type of stuff on track. TSM, very nice. Of course, semiconductors improving after the ASML leak almost caused them all to crash. But now we move into kind of the broader market. And over the next two to three weeks, we're really going to see the crux of the earnings season. Now, this week, you'll notice that we have quite a lot of different opportunities in the markets. And more importantly, Tesla is coming out with a plus or minus 6.2% expectation from the street. Now, you'll notice these plus, these up and down arrows, that's basically the expectations of what the options market believes will happen to the moves. 
But you may also notice underneath, there's not that many bits of major news from the Federal Reserve or from major kind of US economic data. So what this week is going to be about is how are the earnings faring and does the market like what it sees? Now, I think it'll be certain sectors do well, but really the discussion point is again in alternative assets. As we've talked about, we believe that China was going to come back with some stimulus and guess what just happened over the last kind of 48 hours? They re basically said, we are going to do more stimulus. Don't worry, guys, we've got your back. And of course, this really makes sense when we looked at the dark pool liquidity. We saw gold last week, a huge transaction coming in on the highs. Gold stocks will blast through during that Friday into Monday session. We also saw some large transactions coming in near the lows on Chinese stocks, which we'll look at in the charts very, very soon. And since then, what did we see? An explosion in price. So basically, it's a game of cat and mouse between the Chinese government and realistically the market. Give a stimulus, and when they say that they don't won't give it or they stop talking about it, all of a sudden the markets will drop. So really, you're trading a stimulus created market, which is no not really dissimilar to the US in some ways, which is earnings. But at the same time, it's like, what will the Federal Reserve do? Will we get more cuts? Now, as we mentioned, the next one to two weeks will be most important for the markets. And one of the reasons why that is, is because whenever we get these types of stop signs here on our indicator, it basically tells us that pump the brakes because the markets could be in for what we call a pit, which is a pullback in time, or a small correction. And it makes some sense. We've seen a very strong market currently in positive gamma, uh, which you don't want to fight against. And of course, currently making a series of higher highs and higher lows. So as long as that's happening, you just basically ride it through. But if that changes, of course, you will want to be paying attention. Now, how will you know if that changes? Well, let's take a look here at the futures market. There was a pretty nasty kind of rejection there on the Thursday. There was then a buy up through the Friday. So in general, you would have to say the markets are still quite bullish. In terms of bearish levels for the week ahead to look at, I would say somewhere around 5806 will be interesting. And of course, 5780. This area in here will contain some bulls, but if the markets are able to breach this level and keep selling off past this, that could get you a decent, you would say, correction. And of course, that's what a lot of people are looking at now going down to 5,700 or even the possibility of a 5,630. That's probably the most likely expectation of pullbacks at this stage. When we look at the smaller timeframes, you'll notice that it's just a series of higher highs and higher lows. And that's not the market you want to sell. If you were going to do with the prediction here, which obviously we do prefer not to predict and instead use price action to show us the way and the way is currently up, then you would want to be using an option. Why? Because you don't know where the market could stop. So let's take a look at what the market is currently gearing in for. And that is still positive gamma. So basically this market's still in positive gamma. It's still pushing forward. And the current metric is that we'll be going towards 5,900. Why is that? Well, you can see the options core wall. 5,900 on the Monday, 5,910 on the Tuesday, and a ton of calls all over the board, especially if the markets are able to hold up through the Monday session. Now, the higher they go, the more this will have a flow-on effect. And as we've seen it before, positive gamma can get quite aggressive in markets, especially when the momentum is strong for this earnings season. Now, does that mean volatility is gone? Well, of course, no, it's not. We're in an election season, and that means that anything could happen, especially up until the 5th of November. Let's now move over to NVIDIA, because NVIDIA has been doing very nicely and breached to an all-time high over the last week. What it hasn't done, though, is managed to hold it. And if it does hold above 140, what do we know? That's a super positive gamma switch level. So 140 will be worth watching, especially if you're a semiconductors or NVIDIA trader, and that will be key. Then there's Tesla, and Tesla is getting juicy, guys, because it is in a massive coil. 210 on the put wall this week, 225 still a key level when you look two weeks out. But of course, if you're just looking at this expiration, there's going to be a huge amount of positive gamma as we break some of the key levels. And what we're looking for key on this is going to be the island reversal pattern because island reversals are pretty powerful by themselves, but I think it's like six or seven days now of small range trading on Tesla. And that always equals an explosive 
big, large move. And that's going to be the exciting part for Tesla traders. So just before we jump into the charts and we look at all the key levels that you need to be watching right now, I wanted to give a big shout out to the sponsor of today's video, which is Tiger Brokers. Now, if you're from Australia and you've been thinking about switching brokers or even just getting a broker for stocks, especially US ones, then you may have just found the right choice. Tiger Brokers are not only offering a bunch of bonuses for viewers out there, but they've been winning some massive awards. And of course, as we'll discuss in just a few moments, the Hong Kong markets and Chinese markets have been heating up. And guess what? Yes, Tiger Brokers gives you access to not only 9,500 plus stocks and ETFs, but also now they've launched the Hong Kong market. So if you've been thinking about a broker with a HIN here in Australia that lets you trade ASX, US stocks, US options, Hong Kong stocks, and ETFs, they've got it all. And of course, you can check them out in the links in the description down below. And one of the reasons we, of course, like Tiger Brokers, well, it's because they listen to your feedback and they've even added AI into the apps with an investing companion that quickly takes snapshot of news and breaks it down into a very concise little package, saving you time and more importantly, giving you the clarity in markets. So what are you waiting for? Check out Tiger Brokers in the links and the pinned comments down below. And if you're from somewhere outside of Australia, remember Tiger may be an option in some of your countries. So let's now take a look at the latest charts when it comes to the lead indicators. We've talked a lot about banking and finances and how debt has been growing, and that's a strong thing for the GDP and the economy. Of course, over the medium term, that is the next kind of one, two, three into six months, we believe that's a strong factor towards the bull end. But also when you start to look at things like home builders making new highs and of course, regional banks breaking out over the last week, this is the type of thing that you want to see as a bull in markets. Does that mean there could be a pullback? No, of course there could be. There may be an excuse, concerns over earnings, concerns over geopolitical tensions or anything else could cause these markets to pull back. But we're not seeing the warning signs yet when it comes to an overall banking collapse or something even worse. And that's because really most of the indications of the overbought kind of market conditions right now come from indicators and they come from sentiment. Of course, FOMO being the big one here. And when everyone gets trapped, as you know, the market likes to do what it everyone least expects. So it's just going to be a warning sign to continue to watch these markets with caution. Now, what are some of the markets that are coming down to more interesting zones? Well, one of those has been treasuries. Now, a lot of people are turning negative on treasuries, and I'm not sure why when you've got a market that's coming back to the key levels. I think it's because everyone expected treasuries to be such a great trade. I have no idea why they thought that. Of course, the Federal Reserve did a 50 basis point cut, but who cares about their cut? It's more important to note that the market already expected a bazillion cuts, and obviously they gave the dot plot saying, yes, we will cut, but we're going to cut at a slower rate than you believe. And of course, that had a huge effect on treasuries. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's you shouldn't be trading the news. Instead, if it's in the press, it's in the price. One of our favorite comment sections here. Hopefully that helps you in the uh, future as well. Remember, abundance mindset, guys, there are always other opportunities. Let's look at the dollar index. The US dollar has been pretty strong, a little bit of a sell there on Friday, but in general, we're kind of thinking at the moment is trying to make its way to the next key resistance at around 104. Pretty strong trend, and at the moment, it looks like pullbacks will be met with bull demand. But where the interest was over the last kind of 48 hours of trade was China and metals. And copper is showing the way here with a nice breach of the downward trend line here on the daily and of course, some strengthening factors. Now, if copper is able to break through 4.41, that's going to show that there is a good strength behind the current HSI move. And we'll look at China in just a moment, but this is a very strong first sign and it's happening exactly where we expected copper to have some type of pickup. It's almost as if some of these central banks sometimes look at the key levels and they say, oh, quickly pump the markets, guys, make those comments, send them out, send out the drones. Because, yeah, that seems to be how these markets do trade. You'll notice here HSI got a bunch of large trades coming in around this area here, which we reported on in our last video. And all of a sudden, the market has recovered. Now, has it done enough to switch trend? Probably not quite yet. And, of course, we'll report when that happens. More than often, we're looking at copper to actually show us the best strength in Chinese stocks. But this is a good start. And what this is showing you is that it is a game of cat and mouse. 
the market cracks it, then the Chinese government comes out and says, don't worry, guys, we've got your back. More on that soon. But where really the impacts were, were in gold and silver, and they went absolutely ballistic. And I'll give you guys a clap because almost I can't believe how good gold's been this year. And of course, we've already been stacking that thing all year and loving it. $3,000 an ounce, here we come. It's getting closer and closer and closer to our forward prediction. You might say patience, react, don't predict. Well, sometimes when we're talking about investment and kind of investor philosophy, we do have to have forward projections. Of course, they're based on data and similar history kind of studies. But in this case, 2721 is a massive breach out and it shows you the strength behind the BRICS purchasing of gold. And of course, in general, what happens when an asset class starts to get momentum. Now, we've already reported that ETF flows have been behind the curve. So what this means is that if everyone else is starting to see gold like we are, then that could be just the beginning of huge inflows. And uh, yeah, it's an exciting time, a great weekly close, and it points towards 2,800 being possibly the next kind of scenario here. What might be even better though was Silver's move. And I've got to say, I'm a little bit sad for the day traders out there. Obviously, anyone that's been stacking silver and holding it like we've been discussing over the medium term, you would have loved Friday. What a gain, 6.4%. But it went so ballistic that it almost already reached 34.50 in like a day. Uh, now, that is not ideal when it comes to day trading because, of course, you'd rather a minimal kind of close above and then we could go towards the bull end and uh, go for that momentum trade. But this is very strong and it points towards any pullbacks now being met by bull demand and ultimately going towards that 34.50 that we've been discussing for a while. Now, how big a deal is this actually for silver? Well, the answer is it's massive because not only is it a new high, I think almost on, yeah, it's a decade high. So a decade high here for silver, but it's going up there to reach for potentially the stars. And this is, of course, those famous levels that we saw reached in the 1970s. Yes, I said 1970s and then 2011. Silver has been manipulated and destroyed for a long time. And this is now the inverse head and shoulders coming to that first completion. Now, could we go higher than this? I tend to believe we will, uh, but this is a great first target. And of course, silver's well on its way. So momentum is behind it. I think it could hit 3450 and then we'll have to hopefully get some better structure to continue with the overall upward trend. Remember, silver is still trading against gold and you can actually put the combo into your charts like this and you'll notice it's trading at a 0 0.012 which means that it's still well, well under what we believe silver will ultimately get to, which is a 0 0.015. And funnily enough, if you do the valuation checks, that's probably going to be a 45 to $47 silver. Um, yeah, so it's going to be pretty, pretty high. Now let's move over to some other markets that are struggling that may be turning into the green soon. And that is, of course, oil. Oil fell off, and that's not to be unexpected. Remember, we've always had this 68.50 a barrel kind of area. And this is very exciting for swing traders, for people that are looking at potentially going, you know what, I might want to buy a little bit of oil. Well, it's back to those interesting levels for swing traders. It isn't quite there though for day traders, but this will have wiped out many people's stop losses. So I believe that if, if now we see a big push to the upside in oil, it's going to be even stronger. Remember by having patience here, by waiting for the key levels and not predicting necessarily or if you were predicting having stops underneath here, you've been able to eliminate one of the big catches. And I would say there's a decent chance that markets may try to rally this type of move. Now, if it keeps falling, of course, it's going to be quite weak and it may even take out this low or this low here. But at the moment, the next 24 hours of trade are going to be very important for US oil and UK oil. We will be watching it. Speaking of things that are getting exciting, Tesla, one two, three, four, five, six. Six days of sideways action within a very tight range, meaning that if the market does gap up, that could be a pretty strong island reversal, go into positive gamma, start to get a lot of Wall Street bets and Tesla kind of options traders all floating all over it, and it could push to at least get that gap fill, which is about 238. Now, this is a pretty interesting island reversal. It's been a while since we've seen one like this, and I'm interested to see whether it can hold a good trade. Not sure how many people are spotting it. It's not that hard to spot, let's be real. But uh, yeah, after the 10-10 event, it is coiling. And of course, if it breaks to the downside, well, 
That would be no activation of a long yet. That one will be worth watching this week. Let's move over to NVIDIA now. How is that looking on the charts? Well, 140 is still the barrier. We know a break of 140 brings in positive gamma flow. That will then most likely get further options, momentum behind it. And this will become a very important point. Now, if you're looking at where the pullbacks could come in, it's really those gaps that are down here in the 120s that are most interesting. We don't know whether we're going to get a pullback yet. We have to watch the S&P 500 for signs of weakness. But at this stage, that's all a prediction just based on the fact that, yes, things are overbought. But overbought, it can stay there for a while. Semiconductors are just trapped within price at the moment. But still, the overall kind of theory is up at this stage based on what we've been seeing. And TSM certainly wasn't a bad result overall. What about some other opportunities? Well, uranium really is flying. And we discussed this a few weeks ago. We've talked about it a couple of times over the last couple of months on the channel. And it is now the talk of Wall Street. It seems like every tech company is big on uranium. And all of a sudden, everyone wants to talk about uranium. We may do a special on it soon just to discuss it because it is an interesting asset class. And of course, you may think, well, it's expensive now and it's flying, but most people wouldn't have an idea that uranium was once incredibly expensive. So it's actually still bottoming off from a monstrous loss over the last decade. Sound familiar? Yeah, well, that's a lost decade in uranium, just like we saw in, of course, gold. Now, when we move over to HSI, as we mentioned, the most positive sign for the Chinese markets is that they snapped this 20,000 800 level, getting a little bit higher, getting above the two hour 20 moving average, which was held down twice. That's a great first step. And we think that pullbacks at this stage are probably going to be met by buy demand. If the market does go lower, then of course, 19,100 may be the level to be watched. And that's going to be around that 61.8 FIB, something we will watch and look at. Aussie market, same thing as the American market. We're getting signs of overbought. That doesn't mean it's going to crash. But if it does pull back, the weekly 20 moving average with the most traded zone at 8,000 will be the watch area. And that would be a nice little pullback by the market standards. So, of course, that would bring us down 3.72%. Uh, at the moment, of course, it's really going to be linchpinned by how is China doing the stimulus? Are they just going to say they're bringing the stimulus? Are they going to do a lot more stim? You know, it's all about how much money they're bringing to the table. And at the moment, of course, we'll wait and see how it all plays out. Uh, you just have to be bullish on that overall concept, though. US 2K, nice breakout, great tweezer. This was our strongest index of last week uh, in terms of what we thought gains would come through. It did pretty well. 22.76, just shy of the 22.80 plus close we were looking for. But I still think the overall bullish demand here is strong for the Russell. And if you're looking at this with a one to three month kind of wind up on it, it does look quite good. 24.38 looks like the next level and it's Fairly strong. Pullbacks to be met by bull demand, at least based on the price action. The NASDAQ looks kind of crappy. This is a much weaker market with a little rejection that came through. And now, of course, some consolidation here on the smaller timeframes. If it makes a new high, okay, maybe it'll really strengthen up. But this has actually already shown small timeframe change of trend towards the downside. So will it be the NASDAQ that leads down here a little bit? It's actually in the weakness area right now. It's coiling. We're waiting for, of course, more information. There will be people with stop losses above here that have entered into shorts around this point. Uh, while I don't think it's that easy, I could see people being actually long around here, being short around here, and then playing both sides in the anticipation of whatever the move's going to be being relatively good. Now let's move to Bitcoin. This looks a lot more promising. 68,500 coming under several pressure days. And we continue to believe that there's going to be a little bit of consolidation here and then most likely an explosion to the upside. Whatever this is, it looks way better than it has for months. And we know flows are going up. We know interest is obviously up. We know that generally people are expecting this type of thing. A couple of big public holidays are coming up as well, which obviously get people excited about Bitcoin, and this is a good sign. On top of this, we've got Ethereum also breaking potentially a key symmetrical triangle here. And if that breaks out, then that could push something like a 3,300 is our next level for it. So with Bitcoin, if it does manage to get through 68.5, 
Well, you know what we've thought, this level closing on a significant time frame is going to give us a new all time high and start getting this thing ramping up. So what is this a sign of? Realistically risk on. And I think it comes a lot from KRE, from hyperscalers going back up and really just the market saying, you know what, it's all good. This is the Goldilocks situation. How great are we? We've climbed the wall of worry and now everything's fantastic. That doesn't mean it is fantastic. It just means that this is what the market tends to do. Remember, momentum tends to breed more momentum, especially when it comes to high valuations. So the overall summary is this week doesn't have too much earnings announcements in it, but really the question becomes, are we heading for a lost decade? To answer that, I think it really comes back to saying, are we in a concentrated market that's filled with companies that are at too high valuations that will get knocked down 50% plus? eventually. And at this stage, we're heading towards it, but we're not quite there. So 2025 is going to be a very interesting year. It'd be great to see you subscribe to the channel and obviously follow along because we have some amazing data to be sharing with you along that time. And more importantly, we think that the volatility that's going to come in at the back end of 25 into 26 could be extreme. And that's where it's going to pay to have the information that you need. Thanks so much, guys. You have a fantastic weekend. If you're from Sydney, remember, we're closing these very soon. If you're interested in attending our free Sydney trading event, it's in October uh, 30th. So come and join us in the Sydney CBD. Make sure the link's in the description down below. And obviously, if you're interested in our flash sale or anything else we're running, link's in the description as well. Thanks so much to Tiger Brokers for sponsoring today's video. Remember, they're bringing so many new things to the trading platforms and I'm really enjoying their constant upgrades. It's fantastic to see. 10 years now as well in terms of their anniversary. Bye for now. We'll catch you in the next one.